Hi guys, tonight we're going to learn about nuclear fission and fusion. Prior to watching this flip lesson, make sure that you guys read 25.4 in your textbook to give you a little prior background information. We're going to call fission and fusion our nuclear power for tonight. So we're going to call this Roman numeral number 5, nuclear power. And as per usual, everything that's written in red in the PowerPoint will go down as your notes for your flip lesson. Feel free to pause the video at any time if I go a little too fast to make sure that you get all the notes. So tonight we're going to start by talking about the first type of nuclear change, and that is fission. So capital letter A is nuclear fission, which means the splitting of atoms. The word fission literally means to split in two, and I know when I think of fission, I think of fissures in rocks. So here you can see a giant crack running up a rock, and it literally splits it in two. So fission occurs with a very heavy, large nucleus um, that splits into more stable nuclei, and uh, it does this spontaneously. When it splits, the mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants, and that missing mass is what is transferred to energy being released. So go ahead and pause me if you need to copy this down. You might notice right now that there's missing mass, and that might bring up something we learned from the first semester, which is the law of conservation of mass, and you might say, hey, wait a second, that doesn't seem to jibe with what we've been talking about. Well, the law of conservation of mass applies to chemical and physical reactions. What we're talking about with nuclear power are nuclear changes. So they kind of fall outside our realm of the law of conservation of mass. Because this mass is converted to energy, this famous guy right here, who you guys all recognize, came up with a formula that enables us to quantify that amount of energy based on the amount of mass that's lost. And this is a pretty famous formula that I bet you guys have heard of before. The formula E equals mc squared is what's used to calculate the amount of energy given off based on the amount of mass that goes missing from a nuclear reaction. Okay, let's continue to move on here. I'm going to give you a little history of fission. This woman you see pictured to the right, her name was Lise Meitner. And Lise Meitner is known as the mother of fission. She was a Swedish, a Swedish physicist who worked in Germany um, in the uh, 40s and 50s. And what she discovered while working with uranium was that if you bombard uranium with neutrons, it turns into barium. And when discovering this, she realized that barium was so much smaller that the nucleus of the uranium must have split in half. And she came up with the term fission. So go ahead and copy into your notes that Lise Meitner proposed the term fission while working with uranium. She became somewhat of a uh, famous figure in Europe during the time. Now here's an image of the uranium nucleus right here. In order, for, in order for it to split in half, you need to have a neutron come and bombard the nucleus. And you can actually find certain types of elements that are what we call neutron emitters, and you load them up with neutrons, and then they give the neutrons off, and as those neutrons bombard our fissionable nucleus right here, it momentarily reaches a state of instability and then spontaneously splits in two. Uranium-235 in this case splits into krypton and barium and then in the process it gives off two more neutrons. So right here is the original neutron that was given off, two additional neutrons, and then the missing mass between these two nuclei is what is given off as energy and that's what we consider fission. Now as those two neutrons that were just given off interact with two more nuclei, something starts in motion, and that's what we call a chain reaction. So a chain reaction has three different steps to it. It has the initiation, which is the reaction of a single atom starting the chain, and usually that would be a uranium-235 nucleus being bombarded by one neutron. The propagation is when this uranium now 236 nucleus because of the addition of that neutron releases two additional neutrons as it splits in two and this continues to propagate until we reach the step that's called termination and that's when there is no more fissionable material that's left 
we're going to watch some videos in class that will help uh, help us understand this a little bit and do a little activity outside. Now here's an example of how quickly a chain reaction can take place. It's a little bit slow at first, but you can see here how the growth of my fissionable nuclei is exponential. So we have our first nucleus right here, splits in two, two neutrons are given off, those hit two more nuclei, splits in two, now we have four, then we have eight, and we continue to grow exponentially until whatever fissionable material is being used is completely used up. So just to give you a quick little idea here of what it looks like, you start with one and before you know it, boom, you have what's called the fission bomb, also known as the atomic bomb. So this process of fission is what is used in nuclear weapons, particularly the atomic bombs. There's another type of bomb we're going to learn about in just a little bit that uses hydrogen at its core rather than uranium or in some cases plutonium. So in order to get the uranium, uranium tends to be, um, tends to be the nuclear material that is most desired. In order to get the uranium, there's kind of a there's kind of an involved process, and I want to explain it to you because you're going to hear about it a lot in the news, or maybe you even have. So uranium is a naturally occurring metal, and we talked about where uranium comes from. They find it in this material you can see right here. This is called pitch blend. So it's a it's an ore that exists um, in certain areas of the world, um, and from the pitch blend you can get uranium. This is also the rock that Marie Curie and Pierre Curie used to isolate polonium and radium when they discovered those two, but it's where for centuries people have been getting uranium. You can see here to the white, to the right, excuse me, to the right, you can see this bright yellow kind of powdery cakey stuff. This is called yellow cake uranium. So right after they isolate it from, uh, from the pitch blend, it looks like this, the yellow cake uranium. In class we talk a little bit about Vaseline glass, which is what people used to use back at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, and it was a glass that was tinted using this yellow cake uranium, and it had this bright yellow color to it, and you can see here that classic yellow color displayed. Now, after we get the yellow cake uranium, there's kind of a, um, a, a very long enrichment process that goes on in order to get our two final products right here. So right below the yellow cake, you can see what kind of look like long rods. These are fuel rods that have been enriched and processed for a nuclear reactor. Over to the left right here, you have enriched uranium, and this would be used inside of a warhead. So two different purposes, but from the same exact material. You can use, uh, you can use this uranium through the process of fission in both energy, which we're going to focus on in our next unit, and warfare, which we'll talk about a little bit um, uh, when you guys come into class um, during the next class. So just to shed a little bit more light on this enrichment process, because you hear a lot about uranium enrichment in the news, I'm going to kind of go over it with you really quickly. There's two types of uranium isotopes. So when we mine yellow cake uranium, you're going to have a mixture of both U-235 and U-238. Most of what you get is U-238. U-238 is not fissionable. So that's the stuff that we don't want. But unfortunately, that's what exists at about 99.3%. So there's only a tiny little bit of uranium-235. But that's what we need to get to fill our nuclear reactors, and that's what we need to get in order to make nuclear weapons. So that's where we kind of take this yellow cake, we convert it to UF6, which is a compound where we mix it with fluorine. We send it through a gaseous diffusion enrichment process right here. Once we have the enriched uranium, we convert it to the fuel that we need to use for our reactors. This process here right in the middle, the enrichment of uranium, is the trickiest process to do and there's only a few enrichment facilities um, uh, in the world and most of them are closely watched. So we want to make sure, um, many countries want to make sure they know who has the these enrichment facilities because once you enrich uranium, you have those two different means that you could use it for, and uh, nu nuclear energy is a lot safer than nuclear war. So let's get some stuff into our notes about uranium. Uranium contains two major isotopes, 
U238 and U235. The one we want is right here, the U235. So we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in class again when we talk about the dawn of the nuclear age. Okay, let's go ahead and now we're going to move on to our last type of nuclear change, and that is nuclear fusion. So you can see here a picture of a burning fireball. This is actually a close-up image of a star because that's one place that we see nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is literally the bringing together of atoms. So fusion comes from the word fuse, which means to bring together. Now fusion in its most rudimentary form occurs between two different hydrogen isotopes. In this case, you have H2 and you have H3 over here. Under very, very extreme conditions, lots of pressure, lots of temperature, you can force these two nuclei together. Now, they would normally repel from each other because of those two positive repulsive forces, but if they can gain enough energy, you can force them together. When they fuse together, the process of fusion occurs. What's emitted is a helium nucleus, so slightly heavier than what we started with. You get a neutron, and then you also get a whole bunch of energy that is given off. So our light mass nuclei com combine to form a heavier, more stable nucleus. This is more energetic than fission, much, much more energetic than fission. It's what we use in the hydrogen bomb, the H-bomb. So we have two types of nuclear weapons we're going to talk about in class, the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And they're different because the hydrogen bomb is using fusion, not fission. And fusion is where we got all of our elements from in the bigger, heavier mass stars. And we're going to touch more upon this in our astronomy unit, how stars form all of the elements in their cores when they start to fuse larger elements other than just hydrogen. So just to kind of finish off this flip lesson and lead us into our unit in class on the dawn of the nuclear age, the most destructive force on the planet is our hydrogen bomb, and it is thousands of times more powerful than a fission bomb. The problem with fusion and using it to create energy uh, for our grid is that fusion gives off a tremendous amount of heat and gives off so much heat that it would be nearly impossible to, um, to replicate on a large scale. Fission gives off a lot of heat but it's enough heat that we can control in a nuclear reactor, at least for the most part. Um, obviously, during this lesson, we're going to talk about some uncontrolled nuclear reactions that go on inside nuclear energy plants and, uh, and the trouble we've had in the past with those. Uh, hope you look forward to learning about the dawn of the nuclear age, and I will see you guys in class. Thank you.